What surprises me more than anything else in this world is the total denial of interminority bigotry, not completely denying its existence, but underplaying its relevance or being surprised when it happens. By this I mean a member of one minority group demonising or degrading a member of a separate minority group. Speaking personally here, the one that I come across the most is furries who are attacking another minority group. Of course this is by virtue of me covering almost entirely furries. I'm a furry myself, it's just my interests, and it's just the type of people that I'm exposed to. On my channel, a few furries that I've talked about have produced this denial response. In particular, videos like Magnus Deridian, Vilicify, or Lucky Coyote to name just three. Each of these videos received several comments expressing shock over a furry being a bigot, and shock how a furry could be racist or transphobic in any way. To many members of the fandom, this is a well-known occurrence. Be it transphobic gym furries or that one guy who went from spreading happiness to expressing a very different emotion just the next day, we all see forms of interminority bigotry more often than we may think. And although furries are often seen as one collective progressive mass, beneath all the characters we're just people. We're people who form groups, we differ in opinions, and we do fight amongst ourselves, just like humans are so fond of doing. And by virtue of being a minority group itself and housing higher populations of LGBT individuals, we do see less bigotry than most populations, but we're far from exempt, including cases of extremism. And in these cases where extremists or just more casual bigots become noticed in the fandom, furries as a whole typically retaliate with a strong negative reaction, thus creating another squabble of infighting between two alternative political oppositions. With bigotry this can come in the form of transphobia, sexism, homophobia, or as I will choose to focus on just today, racism. Ways in which racism can be observed can typically be placed into one of four groups, and for each of these groups we will explore real scenarios within the fandom in which this behaviour has occurred. Now I want to state that this video is more supposed to be fun and informative rather than act as any sort of call out to the community. I'm by no means saying that this fandom is overtly racist, or that one person's experience is indicative of a whole community. Everyone's experience is their own and doesn't inform overarching generalizations about a community or group of people. This fandom is a promotion of expression and being the person you truly are, and we love you for being your true self in a world where general populations may not feel the same. What I I want to show you today is just parts of the community where extremism does exist, and perhaps more importantly forms of racism that you may do yourself that you can help yourself change. All of this is to try and foster an even better community and spread more knowledge about what racism is and what we can do about it. In this video I'll be utilising the four levels of racism model to explain as it can be made easily understandable and applicable to many scenarios, such as many of the ones that we're going to get into. The model characterises racism into two umbrella terms individual and systematic racism. Starting with individual, this can be observed in two ways. First a term which for many people is instantly recognisable, internalised racism. These are the stereotypes and prejudices against races that we form as a result of our beliefs and ideologies. Such beliefs are often instilled through social backgrounds such as culture or family. But do note that these can be broken through education or some other social means such as peer groups. The other form of individual racism is interpersonal racism. This is a lot more more of that, you know, casual racism that occurs between individuals. Now remember that racism is not always extreme. Interpersonal racism does not only include running up to a black person and yelling slurs, it can be seen as applied internalized racism. Any sort of interaction between races where personal racial beliefs affect the interaction. And that brings us to the other umbrella term, often described as the invisible evil, that is systematic racism. The two ways in which this exists is institutional racism, where particular institution disadvantages people of colour through policies, wages, or any number of reasons. Finally, there is structural racism, which is interesting as it's likely the least addressed form of racism, and it involves removing black people from social factors such as history, culture, and achievement. History is likely the most common example, where people of colour are excluded from history despite being key components or even vital to entire eras. Now a lot of people do this mistakenly, and I do not harbour any negative feelings to those who don't know about the black leaders in history who have fought for the rights that they have. By definition, the form of racism is the population not being taught this facet of history. This includes a population of furries who may not know this information. Again, structural racism is distinct in a sort of way where people shouldn't usually be held accountable or called out for doing it. Cause unless you're purposely excluding black people willingly or burning history books, there's not much to call out individually. That being said, I want to start this off on a positive note by sharing 
sharing a small tidbit of information which should demonstrate why you as furries should know about these black individuals, why it's important in our history too, and how some people when ignoring this information become ignorant to why we should celebrate black queer folk during Pride or any other month. As you may know purely through observation, the furry community is largely LGBT positive. A 2019 study from the great people at Fur Science found that nearly 80% of people surveyed had a sexuality outside of heterosexual. For this reason, it can be quite surprising that discussion of LGBT history involving black people is so seldom made. The history of rights movements that were begun or heavily contributed by black LGBT individuals. Whilst there are figures from other races who are a key component in this advocacy for LGBT rights, right now I'll focus on one of the most famous examples, the Stonewall Riots. The late 60s marked a time where discrimination against LGBT lives was at a critical point. Not a single couple across all of the states were allowed their right to marriage. Same-sex activity was often illegal. Even small acts to the degree of kissing and holding hands was criminalized by ruling of the US government. Illinois was the only state during the 60s to repeal its sodomy laws. However, in the other states, homosexual activity was punishable by hefty fines or even jail time. In attempts to escape this radical enforcement, many gay and queer individuals would seek refuge in communities or gatherings. A common example were gay bars, providing a space for queer communities to form and heaven forbid hold hands. That didn't exactly solve any issues nonetheless. Police raids were frequent, and many forces had the power to shut down bars or establishments which sold alcohol to gay communities. Those forces and states which didn't hold as much power were still able to invade and arrest the patrons inside. For any of the same-sex acts listed before, or what they described as wearing clothing belonging to the opposite gender, which was also illegal during the time. Stonewall Inn was one such gay bar, hosting these gay communities. It too was subject to regular raids and arrests of attendees. These raids, the arrests, and the discrimination of gay lives culminated into the events of the Stonewall Riot. Police would raid the Stonewall Inn on the 28th of June 1969, arresting 13 patrons and staff. The violence of these arrests were met with equally violent resists. The result of this violence turned into a six-day protest, the bar even being set alight during the protesting. The date and severity of this event is the very reason that June came to be known as Pride Month, and at the heart of these protests were the lives of several queer black individuals. People like Marsha P. Johnson and Sylvia Rivera were key people in this historic movement. Now before the gay redditors from r slash gay or wherever come into the comments to complain about how we don't have a hundred percent clarity on who started the riots, and the debate on who threw the first brick can and will continue to be constantly made, with the contradicting reports on who it really was that kicked off these riots. But it is true that these two black transgender individuals were there during the fight in the late 60s, and together Marsha P. Johnson and Sylvia Rivera founded STAR, otherwise known as the Street Transvestite Action Revolutionaries. This was of course at a time where the word transvestite was a more commonly used term. Marsha herself had also founded the Gay Liberation Front in the moments after the Stonewall Riots, which is responsible for organizing protests and marches for gay rights. Both trans women are credited as veterans of the Stonewall Riots, although despite what many witnesses claimed, Marsha states that she was not at Stonewall to start the riots off, only appearing later to join the fight. Another theory, and the final of many black individuals I want to mention, is Stormy Delavi. My pronunciation would be terrible, I'm really bad at pronouncing those syllables. They were a black and lesbian drag king who had been described as quote, the spark that ignited the Stonewall uprising. The story goes that she was one of the 13 people initially arrested during the police raid, shouting at the crowd of patrons to do something, of which do something they did. They came together to fight for the rights of gay and LGBT individuals. Black people are more than just a part of our history, they are integral to its progression. They should be celebrated and they should be recognized. I'd like to credit Solar Saber, the absolute queen she is who made a video on the same topic, and I credit her video for a lot of this video's existence. She herself is a black lesbian YouTuber who made the use of a black lesbian pride flag in the month of June this year. Her post in the spread of this flag was met with some ridicule from unknowing or confused people. Questions like, what do we need a black lesbian flag for? Just use the normal one. Those sorts of questions express themselves much to my dissatisfaction. We should be proud of these aspects of our history. We should really recognize and learn why we even have a pride month in the first place. Girl, you be prideful in that part of your history just as we are thankful. I saw a thread on Reddit trying to have at least a more civil debate on the flag itself, at least trying to say that it may be excluding people of color from the original lesbian flag, which of course
course, it absolutely does not. The theory itself is quite flawed. The point of the flag is to celebrate pride for a visual manner. Lesbian pride flags celebrate lesbian lives, and the black lesbian pride flag celebrates this crucial part of our history that we should not ignore. I mean, if you really want to play with that mentality, it's excluding people to have a lesbian pride flag in the first place. Why not just use the rainbow pride flag? Are we separating or excluding lesbians from that by creating a lesbian flag? No, of course not. That's a ridiculous statement. You can fly the pride flag that you want to show your pride in supporting, and that includes the black trans people of our community. Don't forget about the people that gave you the rights you may just be taking for granted. They should not be lost to our history or underrepresented. Moving on from that, this next example should be of more familiarity to my viewers. That of a furry convention supported by local institutions which strongly and intentionally breeds an environment unwelcoming to black people. I'm of course referencing Free For All, of which I've talked about on the channel once before. In that video I went over the convention's second year, the events that went down and overall poking a bit of fun at the laughing stock that is this convention. But I also wanted to highlight the political ideologies held by the con's founder and its core demographic. However, there's a key argument made by the con which contradicts this, and that's their vehement statements that they are not a political organisation. Posters in the con read that free for all is not a politically charged space for debates, agenda or harassment. This particular claim of non-political is a form of argument that I find really weird and interesting, mainly how this apolitical argument is the failed distinction between apoliticism and centrist. The term apolitical does not mean to differ from either left or right sides. It does not mean to have a centrist view on the topic. The term apolitical means exactly how it sounds, apolitical, non-political, a lack of interest or involvement in a political discussion or topic. If you choose to live your lifestyle like that, it's perfectly valid. I choose to take interest in a lot of social politics because it affects the world around me so much, but it's not a requirement. Humans do tend to instinctually form sorts of beliefs and political opinions, meaning you the person could be interested in politics but choose to keep your online presence apolitical. You're under no obligation to become interested in politics. If you want to keep your online presence clean, that's totally okay. Just claiming to be an apolitical organization is by no means the issue. The issue comes from the hypocritical misuse of the term. There is a difference between being politically free and fronting a political to mask extreme right-wing views. Political behavior, typically right-wing, has often exploited the term apolitical to downplay the extremism in their beliefs, or as a way to avoid direct criticism of one's personal beliefs, again often seen in right-wing circles. In the case of Free For All, the entire convention was centered around patriotism, which in itself is distinctly political. The con members themselves were a further representation that the label of apolitical is nothing but a fraud. In this photo alone, you can see Magnus Deridian, a person that we've talked about on the channel sporting his confederate flag fursuit, and Ava Nova, dressed in his furry raider's armband which is an allegory to those worn by a certain political party back in World War II. If the con were to be apolitical as they claimed, neither of these outfits should be permitted. They'd breached the non-political stance of the con. That would be the case if the apoliticism claimed by the con had any merit, although this is not true. Hosting a convention with a heavy political climate and housing several dozens of extremely bigoted people, who we will get to in a second, creates an environment that is inhospitable to people of colour or any other minority for that matter. Not by any mistake of their own, their intention was to create such an atmosphere. That's the message spread by the attendees and founders of the con. One of the attendees, Drake, tweeted out this days before the con. No hashtag illegals in reference to who will be attending the con. When you form a con such as this and garner support from an animal welfare company which sears their own set of controversies, elect a chairman run by someone who has ties to the furry raiders and spouts their own racist ideologies on social media, that's when you've created a series of institutions unfavorable to black communities. Sometimes racism is not about saying, I hate black people or actively ruining their lives. It's creating places and spaces where black people feel unsafe in their own skin. It feeds into the system where only cisgender heterosexual white men can exist contently, not like they have 50 targets on their backs at all times. And when I say the other attendees of the con were responsible for this political climate, I mean it. Investigating some of the attendees, you find an overwhelming amount of them were furry raiders, an extremist right-wing furry contingent which brands itself an iconography similar to that, um, not C party. I'm not gonna go over each person in particular from this group as that's irrelevant for today. I previously gone in depth over some of the members before and I don't need a refresher. I want to focus right now directly on just one person, a person which I didn't address in either my free-for-all video or my 
video about Magnus Deridian. I didn't talk about this person due to them not attending Free For All or the crime they committed not being directly linked to Magnus. They were an active member of the Furry Raiders, whose political ideologies ended up spilling into the real world. Benjamin Jeffrey Smith, who we'll refer to today as Polybun, was a member who was fed up with Black Lives Matter. He was angry at Antifa, he was angry with the mask mandates, he was angry at the world, and he wanted to show that anger onto a crowd of protesters one February afternoon. The protesters were calling for justice for Amir Locke, who was fatally shot just 17 days prior by SWAT officer Mark Hanneman. The state administered no criminal charges, and gave paid administrative leave for the officer who fired the shot. There was plenty of reason to demand justice. Polybun would approach the crowd demanding that the protesters leave. When being met with equal demands from the other side, he grew angrier. Eventually, he drew a weapon. The only fatality was a 60-year-old woman who was unarmed and pronounced dead at the scene. In the events previous to the shooting, Polybun could be seen in chats sharing willingness to engage in violence. The messages largely slipped under the radar with little attention given to them. That was until the online hostility transformed into real-world violence as seen on February 19th, 2022. I bring that up as a story of interpersonal racism. It's the actions of someone directly responsible due to their ideologies. However, I want to state that this is literally the most extreme example possibly ever. You can't really get worse than this. Not to mention that topic goes far more in depth, and I'm just not going to compete with Tujo Panda's hour-long video on it. Typically, interpersonal racism comes in the form of small interactions, say Fiddler Fox from my last video being uncomfortable at the sight of a black man in public. Microaggressions could also fit under this category, and this is something that a lot of people watching, including myself, can fix upon. Now just to be clear, I'm not saying people who do this are racist. I'm aware that my brain can do it as well. A microaggression is quite literally defined as an unintentional statement or action. It could be an automatic brain response that you picked up earlier in life. Like girl, we ain't perfect. There's no harm in challenging ourselves to be better at times and maybe stop doing things that hurt other people. Sometimes the things that we say that we don't see as wrong can be marked as racist or bigoted. Doesn't make you the person racist. It could just be a misunderstanding or learning curve that you're improving upon. Maybe it's taking you a while to get used to someone's preferred pronouns. Something I myself am considerably terrible at. Maybe, just maybe, the actual racist thing that you're doing is refusing to respect someone by continuing to do something that makes them uncomfortable because of woke cancel culture, or just some bullshit like that. Our social environment is going to play a vital role in how we perceive and interact with other social groups, which gives me a great transition into our final form of racism, internalized racism. We gain this through many, many ways. Too many to even begin to list right now. But some major, mostly universal ones are family, peer groups, and media. One historic example would be the 1915 film Birth of a Nation, which has been described without word of a lie, the most reprehensibly racist film in Hollywood history. A title that is understandable when you realize it's a glorification of the KKK and white supremacy against the bad, sexually aggressive black people, who were mainly just white actors in blackface. The film was seen by an estimated 200 million Americans in the next few decades after its release, and the film has been credited with sparking mass violence against black communities, and no doubt a catalyst to more extreme acts at the time. Today the media doesn't need to scream racism in our face to promote racial discrimination. It can work in much subtler ways which, whilst not screaming racist at first, can and do have extreme impacts. Humans are exceptionally good at pattern recognition, recognizing patterns of behavior or stories which paint a repeating pattern. If black people of color are shown more in crime news and crime shows disproportionately to the actual amount of crime, consumers of that content pick up on those details and form inaccurate assumptions. And I know how we as people can be sometimes. The belief in autonomy is freeing yet often illusionary. We don't have nearly as much control over how we intake, interpret, and perceive concepts such as bigotry as we may think we do. The types of media we consume and the people that we surround ourselves in, by choice or not, are those that largely define our beliefs. There are tons of examples that I can pull from to explain this. One of my personal favorites is consumers of crime dramas and the disproportionate amount of police involvement they believe happens in their community. A great way to improve these faults is to promote accurate and informal information. Whether we have free will over our own lives and beliefs is not a topic that I want to get into right now. I think people will literally kill me for getting into that. Let's just right now entertain the idea that we have some control over the influence on other people's lives. So by spreading knowledge and information, we give the greatest gift that we can ever give. The gift of respect and dignity. I really love this community.
community and the stuff that we can do to make it better. It's changed my life. I would love to see it be made into a place accessible to everyone so it can change their lives too. So thank you again to the dear Solar Saber for inspiring the video. I want to say thank you to the subscribers for the recent support on the video so far. Thank you Scott Corfin for making the FNAF movie. No reason in particular, I just had a lot of fun watching it. And thank you for watching the video. I'll see you losers next time. Peace.